welcome to another edition of our Memory Lane podcast on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcasting Network. And if you grew up loving sports in Pittsburgh in the 70s, 80s, 90s, or whenever, you read Bob Smizek, you heard Bob Smizek, a legendary Pittsburgh sports figure. He, he had seen it all for many, many decades. I'm real pleased to have Bob uh, on the podcast to share some memories. How are you today, pal? Uh, Corey, I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm doing fantastic. And uh, Bob, I, I, I am not from Pittsburgh. I, I got here in 1999 to cover the Altoona Curve, but I was a big fan of yours as a, from a sports oh, journalism standpoint. I, I, I'm just curious, what are you, you're, you're retired now. Usually we like to start the podcast, kind of give people an idea of what they're doing these days. So what are you up to these days, Bob? <laughs> uh, just about nothing, Corey. You know, when I first retired, which was uh, from the print, uh, print edition of the post Gazette, which was 2000, the end of 2008, I almost immediately went into a, 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 a blog on the Internet. And I did that for five years, and I really worked hard at that. Uh, I really enjoyed that and had a good time doing that. But after I gave that up in 2015, I've just been taking it easy, enjoying myself. I want to sit around the house all day. I sit around the house all day. Get out with friends for lunch or beers sometimes. My wife and I go out for dinner. It's, uh, you know, it's what retirement, I think it's what retirement should be. Do you still watch all the Pittsburgh teams and maybe especially the Pirates? Well, that's interesting you bring that up because my interest in sports has dramatically dropped. Uh, and I, did, I was totally unexpected, to be honest with you, because, you know, I've been a sports nut since I was seven years. I can remember keeping score of Pirate games when I was seven years old. And I, may, I remember drawing, making the lineup up at my little desk in my bedroom to, to keep score of the Pirate games. But since I've retired, you know, you can't ignore, the, you can't miss the Steelers. So I watch them every Sunday, and I'm still a big baseball fan as bad as the pirates are it's my fa- it's always been my favorite it's always been my favorite sport to cover i should say and uh, i still there's not a game i don't either listen or watch a little bit of it i usually watch a great deal of it so i'm very into baseball but the other sports i was a big pit basketball guy i, I don't follow too much anymore the penguins are going completely off my radar. Uh, Pitt football and Penn State football, maybe a little more, but again, uh, you know, they could be on TV and I wouldn't turn them on. That's that's how I've declined. (laughs) I want to share something with people who follow sports and love sports that may not know this about sports media. This has definitely been the case for me. I'll ask if this has been the case for you as you see what happens is Everybody loves sports when they're younger, and, and we get involved in sports media, and we're around. we had our favorite teams. You had your favorite teams. I, I did as well. When you're in the media, now you can't be a fan anymore. And, and this is something that really surprises a lot of people when I tell them, Bob. You, you can't be a fan anymore. We have a job to do. We you're All these favorite teams that you have that you love, we have to analyze them. We have to write about them and see them, and, and sometimes you see the warts and all. And quite frankly, I've done this about 30 years. I am far less of a sports fan than I was when I was 15, 16 years old. Did did that happen to you? Did, did you know many people in sports media that, not to say that they're not a fan anymore, but it does kind of suck that fandom out of you a little bit? Oh, oh, absolutely, Corey. It's almost like as soon as you go into the job, there's a great transformation. There. And it's all about the story. You 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 don't root for teams. You root for stories. I remember... Uh, this is when I was covering the Pirates in the 70s, and I was doing some research before the game, and I came across some statistic that uh, the Pirates, who had always been very poor against left-handed pitchers, were now doing very well against left-handed pitchers. And I was going to write that story, but they were facing a lefty that night, and they had to do well against that lefty or the story wouldn't work. Well, they clobbered lefty and made the story perfect. I wasn't rooting for the Pirates. I was rooting for the story. I think most guys are that way. You run into a couple of people, maybe more than a couple of people, but a definite minority who never lose their fandom. And you can certainly see it uh, in the press box. And unfortunately, sometimes you can see it in their writing. Folks, that is 
absolutely 100% spot on what Bob just said. If you have an idea for a story, you are absolutely rooting for something to kind of go that way to back up the idea. The left-handed pitcher stat, that is fantastic. I, especially if you're covering baseball, because baseball is an everyday thing, right, Bob? And and to try to find something interesting or different on an everyday basis c- can be pretty challenging. It's a real challenge, no question about it. All right, so I want to go back uh, and and kind of take a look at your overall career. Can you tell the folks when you started, just where where are you from originally, how you got involved in sports media, and and just kind of walk us through the timeline of your career? Uh, I I am Pittsburgh, born and raised. In fact, the longest I've ever been out of Pittsburgh was when I covered the Pirates in spring training. I went to the uh, Pittsburgh City Schools. I went to the University of Pittsburgh. I did some graduate work at Duquesne University. Uh, my first job was with the Pittsburgh Board of Education. My second job was with the Pittsburgh Press. So uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Pittsburgher to the core, I guess. I got into journalism when I was in college at the Pitt News. I was the sports editor of the Pitt News, and I, I really enjoyed it. But I had uh, not a lot of confidence in myself. And when I graduated, I had a degree in education. I never even applied anywhere for a job. I mean, I could have, I'm could. i sure I could have, maybe could have got a job in some of the suburban newspapers, but I didn't do that. I also liked teaching, too. So after uh, four years of teaching, and again, I had a small imprint in the Pittsburgh market because of my sports editorship at the Pitt News, and also I worked for a publication that uh, Jim O'Brien and Dino Cook uh, published called Pittsburgh Weekly Sports, and I, I did some regular writing for them. So one day, I was in my office at Point State Park. I mean, at Point Park College, where I was the uh, part-time SID to supplement my teaching income. Phone rings. It's Roy McHugh, the Pittsburgh Press. I didn't. I didn't even know he knew who I was. He offered me a job covering high school sports. I thought about it for a long time. Well couple weeks and decided I'd give it a try, figuring I could always go back to teaching if it didn't work out. Well, it did work out, and teaching jobs became so hard, I probably couldn't have gone back to teaching. So uh, that was in 1969, and I worked for uh, 39 years. Uh, what, uh, what a great story. Can you uh, share if you had a favorite Pittsburgh sports story as a fan growing up in the 50s or 60s, be it a Maz or, or uh, what, 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 any, other, any other story that you look back on when you were a fan growing up? Well, I, you know, it has to me, <clears throat> as soon as you said that the first thing that popped in my mind was the seventh game of the World Series. Uh, I was not there, uh, but... What I remember so much about that, of course, obviously, it was a great game, back and forth, back and forth, and Mazeroski's home run is unforgettable. But after the game, my friends and I, uh, I was a Pitt student at the time, we went downtown, we parked up at Duquesne, walked from Duquesne all the way down to the point and all the way back, and everyone was having a fantastic time. Um, no, No one was causing trouble. There were no fights. There were just everyone was just delirious with joy. First championship in 27 years, so that always sticks in my mind as a great time. And I recall that the next time they won the championship was 1971, and I was covering the Penguins at the time. And I did the post game show with Jim Forney, <clears throat> who was the play by play guy then. And what we talked about was the brawls that were breaking out in Pittsburgh after they won the championship. So a somewhat different um, culture. And is, I think, I don't know, without getting too preachy here, I think we can see the way all this, all this is directing. All of, <clears throat> excuse me, all this is going. In 1960, nothing but pure, unadulterated joy. People just having a fabulous, fabulous time. So you covered... Uh, on a beat basis, the Penguins, you covered the Pirates, you covered Pitt. Did you ever cover the Steelers as a as a beat writer? 
No, I did not. I covered high school for two years, mm -hmm. the Penguins for one year. Yeah, of course, I was very fortunate. Let me tell you, I, can, I got to the press to do the high school job, and I did, never thought of anything else. And then one day I was in the press box. I wasn't covering the team, but I was just there to watch the game. Roy McHugh comes up to me, and he says, would you be interested in covering the Penguins? Well, I said, I'll have to think about that. So I sat there for about 10 minutes. <laughs> I went back and said, I'd be very interested in covering the Penguins. So I, after two years of the job, I'm covering the National Hockey League. Now, <clears throat> I do the Penguins for one year, and as the Penguins season is winding down, um, Roy Mc, um, Bill Christine, who is the baseball writer, has decided he's, leave, he's leaving to go to work in Chicago. And Phil Music, who was the Steeler writer, he's leaving to become sports editor at the Post Gazette. So now the. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not uh, hold on. Right, to make a, oh, no. Pat Living, McHugh leaves. Pat Livingston replaces him as the sports editor. Christine, the baseball guy, is going to Chicago. So there are two jobs open Steelers and Pirates. Phil Music was the obvious natural guy to handle one. I kind of was the second guy. And Phil said to me, I, I don't care which one, you take the one you want. So I <laughs> took the Pirates. He probably got the better end of the deal, but I was very happy with it. So talk about being at the right place and the right time and being very lucky. Three years in the business, I'm covering baseball. I'm going to the World Series. I'm going to the winter, winter meetings in Hawaii. It was just, a, you know, I'm traveling, uh, traveling a lot of times first class on flights from Pittsburgh to Los Angeles and things like that. So I, I never, when I left my teaching job to cover high school sports and I was, uh, you know, uh, out at the Braddock, North Braddock game. I never, never, ever dreamt I would uh, achieve what I achieved that, that quickly, all through, all through a lot of luck. Now, you later became a columnist, which, and look, for folks in the, in the media, we understand kind of the differences between beat writer, columnist, and maybe most fans do as well, but maybe not everybody. When you became a columnist and you transitioned into that role, whereas now there's more commentary, there's more opinion, those kinds of things. Did, did you enjoy your career more after you had become a columnist, or did you, did you enjoy the day-to-day -day grind of the beat? I enjoyed I, I, covering beats was the greatest thing in sports. First of all, you are uh, in this active competition every day with other people. But also, you had all these guys who were covering the beat who you became friendly with and had good times with. Like when I covered um, a pit football, Ed Bouchette was on the beat, Tom McMillan was on the beat, and they became life they become lifelong friends. Just had lunch with them about two weeks ago. So to me, the best thing in sports is covering the beat. However, the column is a promotion. It's more money. It's more prestige. But you're kind of... Uh, you're kind of on an island. You, you, um, uh, you're competing not only with the other paper, but you're competing with people in your own paper who are also are writing columns. You want to do a better job than they're doing. You're not uh, being malicious about it, but uh, it was not quite as uh, enjoyable as uh, being a beat writer. What was it like being a media member in the city of champions as Pittsburgh blew up in the in baseball and the Steelers, obviously, in the 70s. J just what was that whole era like, Bob, from a media perspective? Well, first of all, it was so different uh, today uh, from today back then. The, the, the access from the teams and the cooperation you had with the teams were just, just phenomenal. Like in covering the Pirates, that lot, the clubhouse, was open. I don't know. You, you've covered baseball, sure. The clubhouse was open literally all the time. At three from three fifteen, I could be in there. Five, some of the players could be out on the field and like I'm getting ready to play the game. I could be in the clubhouse still talking. Maybe some guy who wasn't playing night or, or something like that. The team was great. You know, there was no internet. Uh, there was very little radio. Uh, coverage. I'm talking about guys in the locker room with uh, tape recorders and microphones. Uh, many times, uh, there'd be three guys in the room. Myself, Charlie Feeney of the uh, 
Post Gazette and Luke Quay of the McKee Sport Daily News. So we were the team. I don't want to say they would. They acknowledged that we were very important to them and treated us very well. Uh, and that was same thing was true with the Steelers. Uh, Joe Gordon was the PR guy over there. He understood the business better than anyone. And I know that music had a great free reign over there. And Glenn Sheely, who followed him, also did. Now that's no longer the case. Um, the media, they now, I mean, now the teams now have their own websites. There's Twitter. They can disseminate the news however they want, and they, they really don't even need the news media. So um, I had it easy in my day. I think the guys, they have it a lot more difficult. We are going to share some more memories here, but since Bob is on this topic, what do you think of sports media today? And I'm not necessarily saying asking what you think of individual writers or websites and how they do it, but just the process. Because, again, nowadays, athletes have their own Twitter, teams have their own Twitter. You, you kind of alluded to the fact that they don't necessarily need the media any longer, but yet the media has a 24-7 news cycle to fill, oh. TV, radio, print, every, website, everything. So how, what do you think of the entire dynamic today? Well, they have a much t- tougher job than we had, and I think by again the twenty four hour um, deadline is just something crazy. <clears throat> when, my, when I started the press, I worked from the press from sixty nine to ninety two. <clears throat> my deadline was like five in the morning. I was never in a hurry. I never other than other than for the Sunday paper. So I had it just so sweet. <clears throat> I had one deadline a day. It was like at five o'clock in the morning. If I had a great story at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I couldn't do anything with it. <clears throat> Nowadays, uh, you got to go right... I, you, I once complained... Excuse me, Corey. <clears throat> I once complained to a former sports editor of mine. I said, Jerry... That was Jerry Micko. I had been retired. I said, uh, I'm reading things on Twitter that are on Twitter before they're, on the post, they're in the Post-Gazette. And he said, Bob... That's the way it's supposed to be. Our reporters are told to get things out on Twitter before they do anything else. So they are under tremendous pressure. Now, in the, you know, some, there are some people who do a really great job. You know, I think Joe Starkey, Gene Collier, really great columnists. Uh, you know, two of the best ever in Pittsburgh, as far as I'm concerned. We had a guy just left town recently. Uh, wow. I'm covered Pitt basketball, and I'm blanking on his name. I, I can't believe it. He was... He was an outstanding young writer. Can you help me with his name, Corey? Pitt basketball or football? Basketball. I'll have to figure out who that might be, Bob. I, I, cause I, I'm I, embarrassed. I don't know. I, but we'll, we'll, we'll get it before we're, before we're done. How about that? Johnny McGonigal, who does Pitt football, mm-hmm. also does a very good job. Mm-hmm. Yes. So now you've mentioned a bunch of names that – a lot of Pittsburgh sports fans certainly would know. Uh, Bino Cook, Ed Bouchette, Gene Collier, all, all of these famous famous folks and everybody. Uh, do, do you have any any neat stories about any of those guys? My my buddy that I, I, I worked for for a long time, Neil Riddell, was really close friends with Bino Cook. What was Bino like? Well, Bino was really an unusual person and really a great-hearted person. Um when I was, say, junior at Pitt, I guess it was, I won a uh, – he, he informed me of this Wall Street Journal scholarship, and I applied for it, and I got it, and I won it, and it was, it was $500, which today is not a lot of money. In 1962 or three, it was a lot of money. But in order to get the money, you had to get a job – and uh, journalism. Well, I had no connection whatsoever. Bino Cook latched me up with UPI, gave me the good word of the UPI. I got the job because of him. I worked here for three summers while I was still going to Pitt and uh, actually made second second year uh, pay grade uh, and learned a lot there. So that's one of the things that Bino would do for people. He always did things for people that may may not even have known about. I didn't even didn't even dawn on me for twenty years how instrumental Bino was in helping me get that job, and I'm sure in helping me uh, get a job at the Pittsburgh Press. You know, McHugh may have 
gone to him because he I, he knew that I knew Bino very well, and they had given him a great resume, a, a great recommendation about me too. And he did that for a lot of people. many legendary sports media figures over there. Who, who were some of your favorites that you were able to deal with or work with over the years? Well, uh, a lot of the guys you just mentioned, Tom McMillan, Ed, Gene Collier, Ron Cook, I certainly had a lot of great times with, with those guys. But the person who really stands out in my mind, and I think if you went to McMillan or Bouchette or Collier, they would tell you the same thing, the most brilliant newspaper guy I ever worked with was Bruce Kyden who was the sports editor and the columnist of the Post Gazette for a long time. And uh, he was a great writer. He was a great reporter. I'm using, I'm not using the word great loosely. He was a great editor, and he was uh, unbelievable. No one ever was his equal on deadline. He was as good on deadline as he was uh, having two hours to write. He beat a boxing match in uh, Las Vegas, dictating to the phone, dictating over the phone to the people at the desk, just absolute brilliant writing. But uh, he was an unusual person also. And I guess my favorite story about Bruce that shows you the kind of way he could make things go his own way. Uh, it was 1983. I was a, My first columnist job was at the Post-Gazette. He was more in a uh, editing fashion and writing columns. But... Um, he stayed. We always did boxing. So it's a, it's Friday. I'm at the U.S. Open in New York. It's September. He's Friday covering the fight in Las Vegas. Saturday, neither one of us has anything to do because there's no Sunday paper for the post set. So on Sunday, one of us has to be in New York. One of us has to be in Green Bay for the Steeler game. Wouldn't you think that he'd say, Bob, you stay in New York, finish up the tennis, I'll fly to Green Bay, cover the Steelers. No, no. <laughs> Bruce wanted to get to Pittsburgh that night because he had a TV gig. So he flew to Pittsburgh. Then he flew on New York to cover the U.S. Open. I flew to Green Bay to cover the Steelers. So it was not the, not the most, like, the best logical way to run a business, but that's the way Bruce did it. And he was, um, he, he was a genius, but a, a tough guy to get along with, yeah. Bob, do you have a favorite memory or moment or team that you covered uh, throughout, I mean, you, you, you've got lots of different ways you could go with this, the Steelers championships, Pirates, Penguins, what have you, but it, it, are there one or two memories that you always look back on and, and, and are really happy about being there, kind of being a part of it? <laughs> well, um, I don't know if this is what you're looking for, Corey, but my favorite story in baseball uh, with the Pirates involves myself, and this was 19... 19- 73, and there was an, we were interviewing, I believe, Richie Hebner, and I was at the back of the, um, it had to be 10, 12, uh, what's that? Anyway, I was at the edge of the group. It was, it was a Saturday afternoon. There were more people there than, than normal, and I hear behind me, someone is agitating me. He's mocking me. I turn around and I see it's Bob Johnson, who's the big burly right-handed pitcher for the Pirates. And then I put my uh, mind back into the interview, and I can still hear him chirping back there. So now the interview is over, and I turn around, and what do I see? If not the whole, I would say, guys from the right side of the locker room have formed a line. Guys from the left side of the locker room have formed a line, and there's like a tunnel. Not not the whole team, but maybe 15, eight in one side, seven in the other. And there's a tunnel between me and Johnson. And he's furious. He's looking, he's snorting down at the other end. And I said to him, best line of my career, off the top of my head, I said, Johnson, if you think my questions are stupid, you should hear your answers. <laughs> well, with that, he roared and comes charging down that tunnel to pulverized me, I suppose. <laughs> and when he got about 10 feet away, Jim Campanis, uh, 
who was a backup catcher. It was only his only time in the major leagues. He was the son of Al Campanis, the general manager of the uh, Dodgers, and Jimmy was about 30 pounds overweight. He grabbed Johnson, put him in a bear hug, and threw him back to his locker, and he <laughs> saved my life. Because if Johnson had been allowed to come at me, I don't know what he would have done to me. Was he upset? Was Bob upset over one thing in particular? Well, he was upset. I, he, he was not having a good year. I'm sure I was depicting him in less than a favorable light. And I later learned, and this could have had something to do with it, that he was an alcoholic. And it's entirely possible. It's crazy that signs that, you know, he may have not been scheduled to pitch that day or had pitched and was in the locker room. He may have been drinking to start the whole thing off, too. So, you know, that, that is always stuck in my mind. I have not had many confrontations with players, but that one uh, uh, really did. And uh, I'll tell you another story, Corey. Not a great moment, but... It always has stuck with me. The Pirates were in San Diego. This was also 73, I guess, and um, really struggling that year. And they had picked up a shortstop named Dal Maxville. You may know the name. Mm-hmm. He had a nice career with the Cardinals to fill in at shortstop because they were terrible at the position. So now Maxville's been with the team like about 10 days. And now the team is doing so poorly, they reached down in the minors to call up this young phenom, Dave Parker who back then the minor leagues were not scrutinized the way they are today. So, you know, Dow, a lot of people in Pittsburgh never heard of Dave Parker. He was not like, not like O'Neill Cruz, let's put it that way. But Parker gets called up. Now the team is in San Diego, first game of a road trip. Parker's first game. I'm talking to Maxville. Parker comes walking across the room. You would have thought he was Willie Stargell or Al Oliver, strutting like he owned the clo- owned the locker room. Walk, he's got a towel around his waist. Walks across the locker room, gets on a scale, weighs himself, struts back to the struts back to the uh, his his locker. Maxwell looks up to me and says, "I don't know who he is, but I'm glad he's on our team." <laughs> and that was very true for every team he ever played for for the next 15 years. A great player. A very cocky player, a great teammate, a great leader. Uh, a that's terrific great. guy, yeah. I, I want to ask you one about one more subject, and this would be um, the early 90s when the Pirates had the three consecutive playoff appearances. But 92, and I, I don't, I'm not going to get into the slide or, or any of that stuff. I want to know from your perspective – uh, the financial part of it, how baseball was about to change and how it ultimately did change with the Pirates losing for 20 years. Did you see it coming, Bob, as 92 is going on and you know you're following the Pirates, you know the financial situation, you know Barry Bonds is, is going to leave. What, was there a, was there any kind of inclination or feeling that the bottom was going to fall out of the Pirates and that they were going to be in the abyss for 20 years? Oh, absolutely, uh, uh, Corey. Uh, I mean, the team, uh, I wouldn't say they publicly acknowledged, but they acknowledged that with free agency they could not afford uh, to sign these guys. They let Bobby Bonilla go in 91. They traded John Smiley, who was, uh, I guess, their, if not their best young pitcher, one of their best young pitchers, a 20-game winner. They traded John Smiley for prospects, uh, and they let Doug Drabeck go in free agency, and then they let Barry Bonds go in free agency. So, you know, the handwriting was clearly on the wall. I don't think anyone dreamt that it would reach the depth uh, that it did. They were, uh, people were saying, well, we've got Al Martin coming up, we've got Kevin Young coming up, we've got Carlos Garcia coming up. They were the three guys who um, were. Um, the best, best young players coming out of the farm system. They got the guy in the uh, Smiley trade, Midre Cummings, who never did much of anything. But people thought they could be competitive, and it would be only a matter of time before they could uh, uh, be competing for a championship. Uh, but it just got worse and worse. And uh, no, uh, I think after a few years, you got the sense that it was hopeless. But initially, you understood it would be difficult, but you did not know that it would be as bleak and as miserable as it turned out to be. I am 48. 
I am on record several times saying I do not believe the Pirates will ever win another World Series in my lifetime. I think they can be good. I think they can make some playoff appearances. I think they can catch lightning in a bottle, as they did from 2013 to 15. But doing that versus winning a World Series is a much, much, much different thing. Uh, Bob, I'm 48. Do you think the Pirates will win a World Series? I'm hoping to live 30, 40 more years. You think the Pirates win another World Series in that time frame? Uh, no, not the way baseball is constructed today. If, if it doesn't change, there's no way. You know, Corey, they can have all the good minor league players, and they apparently they've got some good people coming up. But unless you're willing to get into free agency, you cannot build a championship team based on your your minor league system. It doesn't work. There's no team that has done it. Houston came close to doing it with minor league talent, but they believe me, they they had to add on. They added on. Uh, well, for one thing, they had on Verlander, but uh, they had a very great, really outstanding veteran outfielder. I'm blanking on his name. He later became manager of the New York Mets. Uh, they they added him too, you know. And Notting clearly will not spend the money. We see that every day here in Pittsburgh. They won't even spend the money on uh, on third on second rate guys. I mean, the roster they began the season with was pitiful, and uh, they've done much better than I expected, and, and maybe they'll continue to do that. It's certainly looking better right now, but no. And until you're prepared to make a significant uh, venture into the free agent market, there's no hope that of ever uh, ha- winning a championship, probably nowadays not even making the playoffs. All right. I, I, you know, I hate to say all that. I'm sure you probably hate to say all that because nobody wants to hear all that, but right. that, that is the reality of – of how difficult it is, and would you have ever thought? I mean, again, going back to those early '90s, everybody saw the writing on the wall. Would you have ever thought we'd have disparities of a 275 million dollar payroll versus a 30 or 40 million dollar payroll, and all the perils that can come with that? No, one one guy making almost as much as our team never did. The only hope is, and it may come to this, that the baseball will go to a salary cap and all the other things that other sports go to. And that would put the Pirates back in the ballgame. They would still be a bit behind the uh, rest of the pack, but that, that would give them a chance. But uh, And that may come to fruition, but certainly not in the in the near future. And, and the two sides are just uh, too diametrically opposed right now. But if things get really, really bad, it's possible that both sides will realize, hey, we better do something and uh, – Let's let's go to the salary cap and better and better revenue sharing, right? Bob, those are some great stories, great memories. I I, I cannot thank you enough for sharing everything about your career from the start uh, to all the cool things that you got to experience. Uh, just really fantastic stuff, and I wish you nothing but the best of luck. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Corey. My pleasure. Have a good have a good week. All right, very good. Thank you so much, Bob.